This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now this is the last show before Thanksgiving, which is tomorrow. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I will be interviewing today Gerald Potterton, the legendary animator and director. He directed the 1981 cult classic Heavy Metal, which celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. He'll be my second guest from it. Had Susan Roman on a couple years ago. Um, Gerald also directed Buster Keaton in his last silent film, The Rail Rodder, 1965. He also um, directed um, an Academy Award winning short film called My Financial Career, which is available on YouTube. Still holds up as a really silly cartoon. It's really funny. He directed Donald Pleasance in The Rainbow Boys. And he animated the Beatles' Yellow Submarine cartoon movie, which I just adore. And it's going to be a great conversation today. The man is a legend. And um, I was reading there's going to be a documentary out about his life next year. So we're going to talk about all of that, you know, just the day before Thanksgiving. Oh, and I forgot to mention, he also animated the... He also animated, uh, I guess, produced also The Smoggies. Uh, those of you who grew up watching HBO in the 80s and um, used to watch those early morning cartoon shows, um, I this is going to be just a great interview. So yeah, here is my interview with Gerald Potterton. Hey, Gerald. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? Well, Tommy, nice to speak. Uh, it's a beautiful, clear, sunny day. The only trouble is it's 10 below oh. here in Quebec. <laughs> Beginning of the winter. Yeah, we have, a sun, oh. we have a sunny, cold day over here in California. No kidding. Where are you, where are you located? What area? Uh, Redding, the California. Santa Monica area? No, Redding. It's uh, north between San Francisco and Sacramento. Okay, okay. Yeah, I went through there once a long time ago. I lived in Santa Monica for a year. That was fun. Yeah. Right at the one end of the Santa Monica Pier. Nice. Anyway, nice. that was all long ago. <laughs> this is such a great honor, sir. Thank you for taking the time today. Welcome. I'm just... Uh, I've got the folder on heavy metal in front of me, just trying to jog my memory. Okay. 40 years. <laughs> so going back in time, I was reading that uh, you attended the Hammersmith Art School. Did you gravitate toward animation and film early on in your childhood? Well, I, I, had, a, I had a friend who had a little uh, magic lantern in about 1939, just before the war started. Mm -hmm. You know, we were like seven or eight years old, and I got, I think I really got interested in uh, the picture on the screen, you know. It started just with still glass uh, positives, you know, in color. And right. I remember particularly getting, uh, really falling in love with animation at the Saturday morning picture show they used to have, uh, you know, actually uh, just at the beginning of the war. Every Saturday morning you'd go and you'd see everybody you know, you see, the, you know, so I think we saw Snow White there for the first time. And uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is Pinocchio. I don't, you know, it's just magic, really. Even today, when you look at Pinocchio, it's, you know, we couldn't do it like that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So you so it's, yeah, I mean, uh, when I went to art school, I, you know, I, I was interested in cartooning and, uh, you know, little strip cartoons, and I, I had a kind of art school comic book that I I wrote and drew for, which was, you know, became fun to do that. And uh, and then I did a couple of years in the RAF, got drafted during the Korean War, and I came out of there, and I got a job on the Animal Farm, which uh, was being made at that time in England. American director, produced by Louis de Rochemont, and uh, two years... I, you know, just worked as a trainee animator on that. And then I came to North America, mainly to Canada, mm -hmm. in the States. Uh, went backwards and forwards to London many times since that time. And, uh, yeah, it's all been animation pretty well. Yeah. Did you, did you also go to live-action movies? Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, I got into that. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I, when I was a kid, actually, when I was actually going to art school, I got involved in um, getting, I worked as a kid extra on some of those uh, eating studios comedies that they made back there around 47, 48. Right. You know, things with people like Alec Guinness and uh, all those people. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, actually got paid for actually working in the movies when when I was uh, 15 and 16. That was, uh, and going to art school at the same time. So everything yeah. seemed to happen in those magic years, the teens, late teens. And uh, then you get drafted and the world changes suddenly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's life. So, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, onwards and upwards. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, I did. I really, uh, I had a good time actually on Animal Farm. It was a, we had, uh, we had an ex-Disney director, uh, David Hans. I think David Hans, I think he worked on Pinocchio. I might be wrong. I can't remember now. But mm -hmm. he was the director. And uh, it was a, it's still out there somewhere, Animal Farm. Yeah. What a good story. I actually saw um, my financial career the other day on YouTube. That was a short you oh, made no in 1962. Yeah. Uh, how did you get involved with that? Well, I was very lucky. When I came to Canada the first time in 1954, I got a job at the National Film Board of Canada, which at that time was in Ottawa, which is the capital. And I spent two years there, and then they moved us to, Montre to Montreal, a big operation, a big uh, studio, and uh, well, I worked with Norm McLaren, who was a great uh, classical animator, uh, you know, quite uh, unusual, wonderful Scottish guy. And I was lucky to get in with a bunch of uh, really fine young guys who helped me along my way. And uh, made. Uh, I wanted to. I, I very much liked the the guy that wrote my financial career, Steve Leacock. Uh, well, he was mm -hmm. known. You know, he was known in in Canada and America at that time. Uh, wonderful kind of. Uh, who, well, he's sort of like a one of the American humorists, you know, Robert yeah. Benchley or somebody like that. Right. Like short stories, humorous, very nice. Right. My financial career. That was a that was a good a good little story. I loved making that film, Cutouts. Were, were you surprised? Um, were you surprised that animation as opposed to two D? You know. Yeah. Were, were you surprised the guy you know, that Academy computer, uh, computer animation then didn't exist really? No, no. Were you surprised the guy in the Academy Award nomination? Yeah, I got a yeah. We got a nomination for Academy Award with the financial career. Did you go to the ceremony? Pardon? Did you go to the Academy Award ceremony? Down in those days, they didn't send the director, they'd send the producer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> still got, I've still got the nomination plaque without my, my name on it. <laughs> oh, that's unfortunate. That was the year uh, Jack Lemmon hosted, as a matter of fact. Who was that? Uh, Jack Lemmon, he hosted the Academy Awards that year. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to have met him. I liked him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like yeah. the music. I like the music in that short. It's very like Charlie Chaplin silent film esque, you know. Well, that was Eldon Rathburn. He was great. He was the film board uh, composer and musician. He'd always get a group of people together. He always played piano. Uh, you know, with a four or five uh, guys, and uh, and he, he uh, years and years later, I did a live action film with Buster Keaton. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes across the coast from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, and Eldon, he did the score for that film, The Railroader. It's called. It runs on YouTube all the time. Yeah, it's another film board film, and Eldon was a train fanatic, just like Buster was. And yeah. those two got on like a house on fire when they finally met. And his, uh, you know, his his score was wonderful for that uh, Keaton film. Yeah, I had we, had a, we had a strike on in Montreal at that time, musician strike. Mm -hmm. So Eldon said, "Well, Jerry, we're going to have to go to New York to get the, get the musicians." And we got the absolute cream of the crop. We got 
I got a wonderful. I wanted a banjo player. And we got uh, Eric Weisberg, mm. who, who, who wrote during banjos music used in Deliverance. Yeah, that's him on that Keaton film playing the banjo. Oh, boy, does he play the banjo! Yeah. <laughs> how, how did you come to um, getting involved in the Rail Rider? Well, because I was going to, I was going to work one day, and I went under a railway crossing, and just at that moment. I saw a, uh, the, the head and shoulders of a guy go across on the railway tracks. And when he cleared it, I see he was riding on one of those little motorized hand carts, they're called. Yeah. Or hand cars. And um, I thought, wow, what a way to be, to see the countryside across Canada. And that's how that started. And somehow somebody, I was going to sort of make that originally and sort of animate it, maybe with a photographic character on it you know somebody like buster keaton yeah and then at that time somebody said well buster keaton's in new york doing a little experimental film and i thought wow he's still alive i thought he'd left us you know yeah and um the funny thing is he buster was one of the one of the wonderful guys that made us laugh when we were just eight years old we you know back in childhood and those sunday morning picture shows i loved him and chaplin and Stan and Laurel, you know, and San Laurel and Ollie Hardy. And um, anyway, I eventually they sent me to, down to New York to meet with Buster, and I had a mm. half a page script, the idea. Because he actually starts jumping off a bridge in London and swimming, swimming the Atlantic, coming on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia and crossing to British Columbia and the Pacific Ocean. I mean, that's really the story. <laughs> and uh, he said, it's crazy, but I'll do it. And uh, there you go, we did it. <laughs> he came up and we spent six long weeks together, a tiny little crew, and uh, yeah, it was fun. What, what was he like to work with? Did he have a lot of stories about his past in Hollywood? Who was that? Uh, Bust he? Buster Keaton. Yeah, he talked a lot about Chaplin. Yeah. Uh, Talked a lot about Lauren Hardy. Um, yeah, he knew them all, of course, you know. Yeah. And uh, a really wonderful man, Buster. Was, was so easy to talk to and, uh, you know. Yeah. Not, when you meet the guy, you can't imagine that this guy was so world famous as he was. Yeah. You know, at one time he was the top of the heap in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. But, uh, no what, question about it. And, uh, was the film... Unfortunately, he yeah, went through a really bad time in the 30s with the drink and stuff, and uh, yeah. he met Eleanor, who yeah. became his wife, and she, she's a great character. I mean, she's so so show business herself, and she understood him so much, and she came with us on that on that trip, because there was a documentary made, mm -hmm. Mr. Keaton Rides Again, and of us making that film. And it's all from the National Film Board, which has really been a terrific part of my life, really, you know. I, yeah. Was the film well received? Yeah. Pardon? Was, uh, was, the whale, was the Rail Rider a well received film? Yeah, it got a, yeah, it got a terrific review. Um, Bosley Crowther, New York Times, he really loved it. Yeah. Another critic said it was tinny and monotonous. <laughs> <laughs> but these, these lines, they stick in your mind for so long. But I'm thinking, well, it wasn't so bad. It's still running. It's got over a million hits on YouTube. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you hear people say, oh, you don't listen to the polls, you don't listen to the critics and... Uh, you know, but most of us do, I think, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they say such cruel things that you think, well, this could be something personal in this, this critique, you know. Yeah, constructive feedback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I grew up loving Yellow Submarine. I think it's one of the best animated films ever made. I, I mean, I genuinely mean that. How did you get involved with that project? I was, first of all, I'd left the National Film Board and I'd started up my, in 1967, 68, I'd left and started up my own little tiny company in Montreal. And um, I got a phone call one day 
from London from George Dunning, who was an old uh, friend from, originally had been with the National Film Board as well, Canadian, mm -hmm. but George was had been working in New York with the UPA, you know, the Gerald McBoing Boing crowd, United Productions of America, who were, a lot of them were ex-Disney people who had left Disney to start up their own cartoon company. Right. And George said, Jerry, we're working, I'm doing this film with the Beatles, and I sort of vaguely heard of the Beatles at that time. <laughs> this was 67, 68. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 68. And he said, can you give us a hand with it? Because we're getting pressure to finish it quickly. And and um, I said, yeah, well, what do you want? He said, well, I'd send you a few notes on it. And they sent, and uh, my little studio, we did a little a layout section, in the, I think the Liverpool section with the captain of the Yellow Submarine. And he very kindly gave gave us a credit on it, which was very nice on the film. And yeah. I, I think it was I think his decision, George's decision to hire that the German uh, designer Heinz Eidelman to design those Beatle characters was brilliant because, you know, if we if we'd have gone to to ordinary kind of corny caricatures of the Beatles, yeah, I don't think I mean. Those drawings, you know, the bell-bottom trousers, the whole Carnaby Street revolution, you know, mm. all that stuff. Yeah. It was going on, the brightly colored shirts. I mean, it spread quickly, you know, around the world, really. I mean, you know, I remember, I remember those times in California. It became, you know, those wide-bottom pants and all the flowers and everything. Yeah. Um, I think it had something to do with Yellow Submarine and that design of those characters. Do you yeah. know what I mean about design? Exactly. Uh, the the styles right. of the time. Yeah. The color, you know, the color was so good in that film. Yeah. And the new, you know, the new um, John John Coates, who was uh, uh, the pre one of the producers, mm -hmm. he sent me the uh, the new Yellow Submarine. I was so knocked out with the quality of the the, you know, the remaking of the color and everything. And it looks really good now. The film is a film that, in a funny way, never ages. Yellow Submarine, you know. Right. It's it looks great. It holds up. You know the the meanies of Pepperland. I mean, they they oh, look yeah. they look really good. <laughs> I love the sequence where they all get old and gray. It, it's just it's magical. It really is. Oh yeah. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. I like that section too. Oh yeah. God. Oh God, that was. That was directed, that section was directed by Bill Sewell, mm -hmm. who's a wonderful character, he's Australian. <laughs> he's <laughs> such a great character. And he came over to see us in Canada at one point, and uh, oh, I'll never forget that, because uh, he was such an outlandish character. And his, his little studio room, I remember going there and seeing how he worked, and now it was a complete mess, like a bomb had hit it all the time. But somehow he did that incredible piece of work, Lucy in the Sky, you know. <laughs> so great when you see it. Have, have you ever... He had a, a son, a wonderful, had, very handsome, who became a film actor, he's still going, uh, Rufus Sewell, mm -hmm. if you know that name. It he's sounds familiar. Some, I don't, well, he's been in some big movies and stuff. Yeah, that's it. these sort of things stick in your mind after all these years. <laughs> have Have you ever met any of the Beatles? Do you know the funny thing is I've never met a Beatle. Most of the people that worked on Yellow Sub Submarine never met the Beatles either. But there was I I knew very well a chap called Jack Stokes who was really the animation director mm -hmm. along with George Dunning, and he met them all because there was a big a big birthday bash for the Beatles at the end of the film in Soho, which was the area where George's studio was. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a, I think downstairs it was a, a sex club and upstairs it was a yellow submarine crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were, they were magical days. Yeah, John Lennon liked the movie. He used to watch it with his sons, he said. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I don't... Oh, John. Yeah, it's shocking. Business. Yeah. In 1971, you make a full-length um, action feature called The Rainbow Boys. Uh, what's the genesis behind that? Well, the thing is, when I had my...
my company, uh, we had uh, William Morris were our agents in New York, and they got us some really good work. Mm-hmm. And that one day I'd gone down in the big building we were in, and there was a bookshop, and I saw this book of short plays by Harold Pinter, mm-hmm. the writer, and I, I'd seen The Caretaker actually in New York, which Donald Pleasance was in. He played the, the caretaker himself. Mm-hmm. And I just fell in love with Pinter's writing and Donald Pleasance's incredible acting. And I, I eventually got to know Donald because he wrote a book about a certain little mouse from Liverpool. And, and I said, well, if we get a, well, we should get Ringo Starr to play the, play the little mouse from Liverpool. He said, oh, that's great. Well, you illustrate the book, which I've written, and we'll go, we'll be partners in it. I said, oh, that's great. And now, believe it or not, all these years later, we are actually working on a feature film. It's going to be directed by a friend of mine, John Mm -hmm. Bruno, who worked on Heavy Metal in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, Ringo, he... You know, he's living down there in Malibu, and he remembers it very much. Yeah. The book and the character, and he's all ready to roll whenever it happens. And it will be, you know, I guess mainly CGI animation, but quite a movie, I think. Yeah. Well, I can say at the moment. So, <laughs> so, th- so you and Donald Pleasance became uh, great friends on that movie. And great buddies, and... Uh, I eventually in 71, I, I, I came up with this idea. I thought, you know, I'd seen actually part of the Fraser Canyon in British Columbia, which had just had this terrible flood. I don't know if you've heard about it. No. And there was a little town called Lytton, BC, which last year, it was the, the, no, this summer, this last summer, it was the hottest, it was 50 degrees. And it, I think it was the hottest place on town on the earth and it burned down the whole bloody town and that's where we that's where we actually shot the Rainbow Boys mm. and what's happened with the Rainbow Boys it sat it, it opened to some good reviews and some mediocre reviews and nothing much happened and then now an outfit out in Winnipeg, Manitoba have remade the film a beautiful new print of it and it's actually you can actually see the trailer for it on YouTube. Yeah, I saw the trailer. Did you see it? I saw it. Okay. And uh, I'm just waiting to get a new copy of the whole film. Because we're trying to get a, we want to have a twin, the little town, Knowlton in Quebec, which I live close to, we want to do a, we'd like to do a, a cross thing, a benefit for Lytton, B.C., mm-hmm. have a screening of the Rainbow Boys and... Uh, raise some money for the town, you know. Yeah. How was uh, working with Don Kalfa? Oh, Kalfa's great. <laughs> he was, well, I loved it. Weekend at Bernie's. Yeah. <laughs> He's great in that. Good film. He, he was such a great actor. It's sad he died the day before his own birthday. What a character. I first saw him... Well, about, I, I actually saw him at about the same time I met Donald, which is, you know, yeah. late 60s. And he was in a film by Robert Downey Sr. Oh, uh, Putney Slope? A, this wonderful Brooklyn-accented actor, the young Don Calfer was in it. And I thought, wow, what an actor. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I got in touch with him and we met, became friends. And, uh, yeah, we ended up. We had fun. We had fun making that little film, you know. Yeah. Tiny little crew because we made it for peanuts, you know. <laughs> Kate Reed, she was a, a, an underrated actress. You know, she was Canadian, but she could pass as a Brooklyn yeah. woman or something. Atlantic City. <laughs> yeah. It was one of her films. Yeah, she's she was a brilliant yeah. actress. Yeah. yeah. Was it Biloxi Blues? Um, I think she, one. I think she did that on Broadway, but she was not in the movie. Okay. Oh, she wasn't in the movie? No. Ah. Well, Kate, I mean, we, we had to use a helicopter at one point for about a week, and she was so terrified mm-hmm. going up and down this <laughs> helicopter. And the guy had been in ex-Vietnam, 
chopper pilot, and he had the habit of going straight down in a dive from the top of this 7,000-foot mountain with all the gear hanging off the bottom of it in a net. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she nearly died of fright. Yeah. <laughs> Another great combination, oh my, the three. The oddest combination, actually. Yeah, I mean, there are three different actors of a, of a different ilk, you know, but they're yeah. all good. They're all very good. Well, that's what intrigued me, you know. Yeah. And you... I, actually, when I went through that Lytton area with, with Buster on the railroad mm -hmm. film, um, I met at that time some kind of totally out of space hippies from somewhere. They, you know, they could have been from Texas or... California, God knows where they came from, but they were so out of place in that thing. And I remember them meeting this old gold miner who I based the character on, Logan. Uh, he mm -hmm. was that was his that was his house in the film. That's where he lived in that little right by the Fraser River, you know. Right. Well, it's something here. There's a combination with these characters, the old and the new, and the difference between the personalities and um did you enjoy well, I, did, you know it just stayed in my mind for a few years in a funny yeah um, script in pencil on animation paper actually did, did you enjoy directing live uh live action as much as directing animation well the wonderful thing with with animation is you can actually you go in a little room close the door, have a light box and pencil and paper. Yeah. You can create your own little world on your own, you know? Right. And it's, it, well, live action, you know, you need stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but I still, I like the rough and tumble of the live action as well. Nice. I think for, the, for comedy it's terrific, you know? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so how does heavy metal come into your life? Um, well, it was actually a Cana it was a Canadian-funded film, mm -hmm. and uh, Ivan Reitman introduced me. You know, we had we did know each other, um, mm -hmm. and he we said, "You want to you want to meet up and talk about this film, Heavy Metal?" And I didn't know anything really about Heavy Metal. I'd seen the magazine a couple of times, and the, you know the beautiful women and the tough looking big guys and the, you know, the really, some really good drawing in that magazine <clears throat> at that time. Well, it had its own magic, sort of like Mad Magazine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> a good drawing, you know? Still, even if you look at an old Mad Magazine today, you realize how good the drawing was, you know? Oh, yeah. And, um, but with, 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 we met at the, the Ritz, uh, Ritz Hotel, Ritz Carson Hotel in, Montreal in the fall of 79, we arrived at night time and the cold weather just getting started, I remember that. And he had some copies of the magazine and I sort of leafed through them quickly. And I always remember him saying, well, you don't, you don't seem too enthusiastic, Jerry. And I, I was so busy thinking, how the hell are we going to animate all this great drawing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and 2D animation at that time too. Um, but I, you know, I thought about it a bit. I thought, well, well, it's a chance that, you know, it's a chance to do something. We could get something really going here. And, you know, as it turned out, of course, we, we actually started that film in my apartment in the late fall of 79. And people dwindled in, they'd heard about it. And <clears throat> next thing, it seemed to say, seem overnight. We had this big studio with, you know, a couple of hundred people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a whole bunch of really talented animators coming in from all over the place. You know, especially from uh, California. Came up and suffered their worst, coldest winter of their lives. You know, <laughs> in Montreal. It was a cold winter, that 79, 80. And uh, we got, you know, some... You know, great Spanish animators, Italian, uh, German, uh, Yugoslav. <laughs> people from all over the place. Yeah. And quite a few Canadians, by the way. <laughs> and now, that's where we. That's where 
way we did it, a lot of it. And well, like you know, that's the thing with animation. Even in those days, you, you know, you could work in a lot of different studios. I mean, there were, you know, we had people working in, you know, some of the big stuff, the really good stuff was done in Ottawa, for example, at Atkinson Studio, and people in New York and Toronto and London and LA. We had, you know help from all quarters and um, I was really just a traffic cop sort of I think it was uh, you know got involved more with some pieces than others and uh, I remember sitting in this room I'm in now my farmhouse uh, I remember doing a color storyboard for Captain Stern really enjoyed that Oh yeah, I've, I've always been partial to the uh, the Captain Stern uh, segment. I think it's hilariously done, and I just love how the animation um, is is um, it's it's in sync with the Cheap Trick song. And um, Roger Bumpus, he really sells that hand over fist character. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and those, well, the animation done by uh, two friends of mine. I had a little studio called Boxcar Studios. Right. Paul Sabella and um, Hungarian chap, whose name I've forgotten for the minute. Um, Paul went off to, ended up in LA running the MGM animation outfit down there. Right. And they did a great job with the animation for Captain Stern. It was great fun. Yeah, it was a it was a sort of drama piece. I now I like the piece with the you know when he's rolling the ball backwards and forwards. Yeah, no, that was from uh, somebody pointed out that was from was that from a, an officer and a gentleman? Something with one of the. I think this was just before an officer and a gentleman. It could be from something else. Yeah, something else. It was a. I don't know, somebody mentioned that, and I vaguely remembered it was in a film or in a play or something, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, somebody being interviewed and they're impatiently rolling this ball backwards and forwards on their desk. I thought it was Jack Nicholson, but it yeah. would be wrong. I, I talked to uh, Susan Roman a few years ago who did the voice of Harry Canyon's girl, and she told me that uh, the animator told her specifically that, um, that the woman's breasts went from small to big <laughs> as the production went on. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, I know, directed Harry Canyon. Yeah. You know Von Lambsweird, who has unfortunately left it. Left us now. Yeah. Tall, yeah, yeah. He used to work at my studio and a great character, but poor old Pino, he left us last year in Paris. He was living. <laughs> <laughs> now, it was all done in Ottawa, that, that section. Yeah. Hey, the character for Harry Canyon, I was da I was in L.A. at that time. Yeah. And we were, we were recording some of the voices for the Boeing, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the Boeing bomber piece, whatever we call that. Um, the pilot one? Yeah, the one with the, the one with the green ball comes in the back, you know. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, there was, a, we needed a voice, we needed a, a New York cab driver voice, somebody, you know, Brooklyn, whatever. And I happened to be in, in Los Angeles at that time before we'd recorded the Harry Canyon score. And I saw a film on TV late one night and there was a wonderful guy, uh, what was it, uh, what was his name? Ro Romanus, Richard Romanus. Yes, Richard Romanus. And he, you know what, I saw this film and it was incredibly violent. And he was a really violent guy with a rifle, and he point black killed somebody, and it was a cop. And I thought, wow, that's really, that's really wild. And he ran away, kind of laughing, this hideous laugh. Yeah. And the next morning, I was in the, I was having breakfast in the uh, Sunset Marquee, um, in the Sunset Strip, that uh, kind of Shrash, the you know, the famous drugstore where you go and get, you know, the, they say that, you know, people used to go and get uh, 
discovered the film stars. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's a famous um, pharmacy, drugstore, soda fountain thing. And who should be sitting in the next little uh, cubicle there was Richard Romanus with a bunch of guys having a great time, all laughing. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that guy's, you know, his, his accent was so... It sounded very New Yorky to me, the way he t I heard him talking in this film. Yeah. When I heard him talking with the guys, right, no, and I said, oh, Mr. Romanus, well, we're doing this film and we're recording something, and I, I said, blah, 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 and I saw, saw you last night on TV, and I thought you were fantastic, and, he, and I, I really meant it, you know. Yeah. And um, he sort of laughed, and I said, would you, would you mind would you mind if we recorded your voice for this film? He said, oh, sure. And anyway, that's what we did. So that's how Harry, Harry Canyon ended up with that, <laughs> that voice. <laughs> well, it worked, I'll tell you. I mean, he sounds just like his brother, Robert, uh, who did Fast oh, Times at Ridgemont well, High. Right. He's got a brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they still, they're still with us, aren't they? Oh, yeah, they're both still alive. In fact, I talked to Robert here on the podcast a couple of years ago. No kidding. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> funny, the funny thing is that the other producer along with Ivan was mm -hmm. Len Mogul. And Len Mogul's wife, she told me, she, she absolutely rejected my idea. <laughs> this sounded like a good New York accent for a cab driver. <laughs> and I think I said something, uh, something like, well, I've heard lots of New York cab drivers who speak like Richard Romanus in my years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Now, dur now, during this time, Ralph Bakshi does a cartoon movie called American Pop, which had uh, rotoscope animation. Now, I understand that the pilot sequence was rotoscoped? Uh, I believe it was, yeah. Was that the one where you sort of, yeah, you could sort of see the live action coming through, right, on and off? Yeah, the, you could see the actors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, good old Ralph, I mean, you know... He really had a good shot at it, and, um, yeah, well, Fritz the Cat was kind of fun, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Fritz the Cat, uh, Hey, Good Looking, which Richard Romanus did, uh, the voice of the main character in that movie. Uh, oh, no kidding, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. He did a couple of, uh, Bakshi's movies, but... Hey, it's interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah. Good. But that that sequence, that pilot sequence, it, it, it's it's so effectively chilling that I'm not surprised that it was rotoscoped because it just looked like it was pulled off so well animation wise. Yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. Do you have any favorite um, sequences in the movie? So any rotoscope? Any any favorite sequences in the movie as far as the stories yeah, go? I think. Um... You know, I think my favorite probably is Harry Canyon. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I was so much attached to Captain Stern. Yeah. Like that, and I'm an airplane nut, so naturally the Flying Fortress. In fact, I'm just finishing a painting now, the Memphis Bell. Nice. Doing, I got into painting airplanes. Um... Yeah, and the, well, there's some, you know, there's some Tana, you know, which John Bruno directed. It's a big sequence. There are parts of that which are yeah, it's beautiful. Particular. It's it's beautiful. I also love John Candy as Den. He he just was so brilliant playing that sword and sorcery character. <laughs> oh God, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh dear old John Bruno. Marilyn Marilyn Mar Lightstone. Yeah, she's. Great chap. Yeah, Marilyn Lightstone is the queen, and Martin Lavitt is the uh, the prince, and he's kind of flamboyant. <laughs> I love all Please. of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you amazed at the impact this movie has had over the years? Well, you know what? We we ha they had a they had a, a screening at fortieth anniversary about three months ago at the Cinémathèque Québécois in Montreal, yeah. and the place was packed. They couldn't get more than they weren't allowed more than a hundred anyway because of the, you know, pandemic business. And um, I thought, well, 
people, a lot of people, you know, guys that have worked on a film that I'd forgotten about them, you know, years have gone by, and it, 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 it was, it had a very powerful impact mm -hmm. on the audience, and I, you know, people that hadn't seen it, and a lot of the people who had seen it, of course, they were, f f you know, fans. Right. It, it hangs together, you know. It does, you know, and the soundtrack is amazing. I, I've owned it on CD for over 25 years. I love it, you know. Okay, yeah. How come, how come it took so long for the movie to be released on VHS, though? Here's the deal. Mm -hmm. The deal was, it, it was I, remember, I remember Ivan found me on the night after. We had a double premiere, right? Right. In, was it July of 81? One at the, the Zeke Field Theater in New York and the other one at the Dome in Los Angeles. Right. And I remember Ivan told me the next morning after the openings and he said, Jerry, we've got a hit. And I thought, wow, that's nice. And then, you know, nothing much came out. It came out and it did very well here and there and Paris and L.A. and started, you know, in America and Canada. It was a top grossing film. And then... We thought, well, when's the DVD coming up? And apparently, permission hadn't been obtained for the rights to a lot of those groups. You know, all the, you know, I don't know, you know, Fagan and Cheap Trick and Devo and Sammy Agar and God knows who else. Right. You know, Stevie Nicks. I mean, you know, people, the, the rights hadn't been cleared. Mm -hmm. So they brought it out like three was it three years later after the movie? Probably. Come out in like in 80, 86, 87 or something. I don't, I don't know, around 1992 or 3, I used to see the movie uh, all chopped up on TNT or TBS, you know, one of the Ted Turner networks, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah, and the music was intact, I mean, the, you heard all the songs in that movie, in that version of the movie. Okay, well the thing is, what happened, I remember my son, uh, Oliver Sending from London, he had uh, the whatever the American, what was it called, bandwagon or something that shows all the top. It was the top selling DVD in America for three weeks in a row. Mm. And I, I, you know, I've still got it in my filing cabinet, you know, printed up, right? and it made a lot of money, you know. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, yeah, when it got re-released, I was excited because then I saw it, you know, uncut and loved it, yeah. even, loved it even more that way. Yeah. Did they ask you to do the sequel in 2000? Well, it's funny you should say that. Um, it was a completely different outfit. Yeah. Um, once again, it was a guy up here doing it in Montreal. And um, they'd had apparently several several different directors on it, and for whatever reason, um, well, he said to me one day, Jack, uh, I forget his second name, Jack, um, French Canadian guy, he said, Jerry, you want to have a shot at directing it? And, and then I thought, well, you know, I don't think so. I, you know, what I liked about our film, I really liked it, and I got it from doing the, the Harold Pinter film that I did, eventually with, with Donald called Pinter People, because it was different. It was like six or seven different stories with different design. Right. And I, and I thought that was one of the things that hooked me when I talked about it with Ivan, when I thought about it, you know, that we are, and that's exactly what we did. I mean, we, we had, you know, different desi designers from the magazine of their stories, and it... it we had to get something to hang it all together, the green ball thing, which the writers came up with. Right. Um, you know, and I think, I think the new heavy metal, as far as I knew, was really about, um, well, the, you know, the, the, the head guy and this, this girlfriend. Um, you know, the, that, was, that was it. And I thought, well, well, it's a different setup altogether, so... Right. Yeah, I didn't think it was as good as the original. But, uh, yeah, it's different. I grew up watching Smoggies on HBO uh, when I was a kid. What's the genesis behind that cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. 
smoggies. Um, uh, that came a friend of mine who, he was a, working with an outfit in Montreal. They were producing live action features. Yeah. And he would come over from Paris every, every, well, every six weeks, two months or so. And he always stayed at an expensive hotel, which they couldn't afford, apparently. And he asked me one day, this was just after we'd finished Heavy Metal, actually. He said, could I rent him a room in my little apartment, which I did. And one day he came up and he said, oh, we'd like to do this. And it's about, you know, it's for children and it's about the climate and all the rest of it. And I've, I've always been inclined, always been involved with the climate, you know. Yeah. So I've lived in the country a lot in my life. You see that seasons change and things change. and. You know all about smog, you know. Certainly if you've worked in London and Los Angeles, you know about smog, you know. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I left London, actually, was the smog. It, you know, it was so thick one year, it killed one one week, one winter, and I think 52 or 53, it killed like 6,000 people died in the city. Wow. It was smog, and it was all from coal fires. So I had the strong, you know, I, anyway, when the idea to come up with something based on an environmental show for young kids. Why not? We get together. We did it as a Canada France co production, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, it was, they did, we did, I think we did like 55. I co created it with a guy in Paris. We did 55 half hours. Mm hmm. I think it. I, I think it needs to come back. I think today's younger generation of kids w would appreciate it. Well, it's funny you said that because um, I said exactly the same thing to someone <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, and they agreed absolutely. And I still get you know people up here. It was very popular in uh, in Quebec. They did a French version, um, and um, you know they realized the. the Effect on kids of those those early cartoons, you know. Yeah. Oh. How do you feel about today's animation being all digital and not really, you know, paintbrush and uh, paper oriented anymore? Well, like I said, Pinocchio was my my all time movie, <laughs> animation wise. <laughs> anyway, um, I you know what I. Well, it's funny. I mean, I loved. Uh, what, what was the film? Up was it? Up, up and away. What was that? Up. No, it was called Up. Okay. Big CGI. Yeah. You know the guy with the balloons on the house, which right. floats up. Right. Um, I've seen a couple of CGI finished features, all CGI, and I actually like them. You know. Yeah. Like you can control the weather, and there was one a wonderful, a wonderful one. They're so expensive to make. That's the problem. Right. Um, there's one with a little dog that goes from Hollywood to it goes from New York to Hollywood. Do you remember that one? And it was called. Uh, I think it was just the name of the dog. He gets involved with a big Hollywood film studio, and there's a big fire. Uh. I, it's called, oh, it's called Spot, or... Oh, you're talking about Wally? No. Not what, not what, yeah, well, I, yeah, I quite like that one. Uh, I, I can't think of it. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was a good one. It's, check it out. It's a, there was a, a little hedgehog in it, too. Okay. With the dog. And the amazing thing they did with that, they changed the light as they crossed, you know, the vast American landscape. You know, I remember thinking, wow, they've got that late afternoon ride in Manhattan, and then you're out somewhere in, I don't know, New Mexico or somewhere, a completely different evening light there that you don't get in the East. Yeah. You know, well, you can work wonders with a computer. So there's a documentary coming out about you in 2022 called The Flying Animator. How did that come about? Uh, well, that's... that's a. Uh, a, a woman called De L Laurie Gordon, mm -hmm. who um, she got involved with a National Film Award production about an animator called Ryan. If you, a guy called Ryan Larkin, he did a 
very simple animation film called Walking. You know, Walking. I can't, can't. If you can make out my London accent, <laughs> Walk, Walking. It's people walking, and he just animated it on paper, and it became a big hit film, and he became kind of a star for that particular film. And wonderful character who died much too young. Yeah. And uh, Laurie and her husband took him, led him into his house because he came down with with really bad cancer and. They looked after him till the end, and uh, I met her at one point there, and uh, she got involved, and she started up an animation festival called Animes in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, a couple of times I did travel with her to uh, places where we, you know, where Yellow Submarine was made, and we went to Poland and uh, um, Czech, the Czech Republic. Right. I think twice we did two trips, and she's been making, she's been shooting that film with me, sort of yapping away. She bought a nice camera set up, and she's working on putting it all together now. Nice. So I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I just sort of blab on, and I remember stuff, <laughs> or I forget. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually panicked just before you phoned me because I couldn't think of the name of the the green ball. <laughs> oh, the Loch Nahr. Oh, the Loch Nahr. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it the green ball. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Was, uh, well, I, I did. There was a wonderful time, actually, in the making of the film. When, yeah. When I went to London, for, uh, I just spent, uh, we spent two days with um, Elmer Bernstein. Yeah. Ivan didn't go. He was so busy working on the score and doing a lot of other things. Right. Um, we went to a um, little church with a hundred piece Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this wonderful score, Elmer. And that was, that was so great because my father was a musician and I, you know, I, you know, I appreciate good music and, uh, you yeah. know, some of the great classics and stuff. And that was really, really good to be somebody like this legend, you know, Elmer oh, Einstein. Yeah. My God, you know. The Magnificent Seven, Animal House, a lot of great movies he, he did music for. <laughs> I know. He was, and he's a, he's a sweetheart man, too. Yeah. And uh, he, he sure seemed like that, it. That little tiny church with a choir and using the church organ. Yeah. And using the on a music um, an instrument called the Ons Martino. If you've ever heard of that, it's like a pre moog synthesizer. Oh, okay. Yeah. It works on a wire, and this oldish lady came over especially for the two day recording from Paris with this strange box with a wire in it, and she moved her hands, and it made those kind of wow sounds and yeah. So you, so you got to see his process of composing music for the movie. Yeah. Wow. Well, Elmer's process. Yeah, Elmer's uh, process. I remember, I, I, I remember us having a sandwich lunch together, and he said, "Well, I haven't, I haven't written the, uh, you know, the ending, the end music." And I, and I said, so, "Oh, really?" And we were in the middle of recording. Yeah. We took a lunch break. And uh, he said, well, what is it, what do you think at the end, you know, with the rise of, of um, you know, the young, uh, what's her name, the, the heroine? And I said, yeah. well, <laughs> um, Part of. of Hollywood ending, big music going. <laughs> and he, he wrote it down right then, gave it to the uh, copyist, and they made it. And they, they, later in the afternoon, the orchestra recorded the stuff he wrote during the during this lunch hour. You know, yeah. <laughs> he was a pro. By God, he was good. When, when you guys did the uh, story about the uh, the aliens doing the cocaine and that robot screwing that 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 stenographer, what like? 
that was one, like one of the few st- the stories, and that's like the only story in the movie that doesn't have you know killings and action packed stuff. What was the point of that uh, story? <laughs> 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 well, if I'm lucky to um, get in touch with one of them, I certainly will. Uh, well, Len, Len Bloom lives in Montreal. Okay. Well, there was what was Len Bloom and uh, Dan Goldberg. Uh, yeah, uh, Danny. Oh God, Danny something. Uh, Danny God, Goldberg. Danny, uh, Gold, Goldberg. Goldberg, yeah. Oh, but well, they they wrote Harry Canyon. I thought they did a great job with that. You know. Oh yeah, they they're they're yeah. I mean they're Second City yeah, guys, yeah. Lynn Bloom is um he's from Southern Ontario, lives now in Montreal for years, and uh, mm-hmm. he runs a uh, a yoga outfit. Oh okay, <laughs> I didn't know that. So is there is Very there nice. is there going to be a release date uh, for the documentary? I I don't know. I have to talk to. Uh, she was up here actually uh, a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. recording a couple of lines that I did, and she was, you know, doing all, doing it all herself. Okay. And she actually, I call, I did speak to her last week, and she's just come back. She was in uh, Tuscany. Right. She's got a lot of footage, so we have to see. It, it, it is, is, is there gonna, isn't there going to be a documentary also about heavy metal? I can't tell you. I don't know. I haven't heard anything. Okay. Um, I'm such a, you know, I'm a bit behind the times with the modern stuff. Yeah. I can't, you know, I just <laughs> somebody sent me a Blu-ray, but I don't have a Blu-ray set to run it on. Okay. And I was looking at it for the other day to give away to somebody. I couldn't find it, so I guess somebody's swiped it. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's ironic. And I bought, I actually bought, I went to Walmart one day mm-hmm. years ago and I bought a copy for like, I know, I think it was $4.50 of yeah. heavy metal from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's Canada prices, right? <laughs> the prices, yeah. That's about a dollar fifty American. <laughs> It's on. It, it is on Blue Blu-ray, right? Did you uh, Did you participate in the the uh, documentaries or the DVD commentaries? No, I didn't. They, I don't think they asked me. I can't remember now. I don't think. I don't think I did. <laughs> I, that's a that's a that's a sacrilege <laughs> to not get you involved in um, in all of that because you did such. Anyway, I, it's, you know, I mean, it's mm-hmm. like. You know, memory plays tricks on people too. Of course, you know. Yeah, but you did such. Uh, a... I spent, uh, you know, I spent some time too working on uh, that when I when I was living in LA for a, a year on the Raggedy Ann and Andy musical. You know, mm-hmm. Richard Williams directed, and Richard, you know, is brilliant. I knew him for a long time, and uh, brilliant animator. In fact, I had a I had an interview with a chap who's written a book called uh, The Making of uh, Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Amazing. That was an amazing piece of work, that film. Oh, yeah. One of the best. A movie that could never be made today with, you know... Eat with you know um, the same type of um, you know animation tricks and just probably ego getting the rights to things. You know, it's just it's 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 a, it's a landmark in time that movie. But well, he, they couldn't have had a better director than Richard Williams to do it too. Oh yeah. It, oh. it was a you know what his name was the director, but Richard did the animation. Ro- Robert Zemeckis directed yeah, it. Zemeckis, yeah, he's a good director. A very good director. So yeah, what did he direct recently? I saw it was terrific. I saw I saw him I saw an advertisement for something he directed. I can't remember what either. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, he did that movie a couple of years ago where Steve Carell's the 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 pilot or something. Yeah, I didn't see it. I missed it. Yeah, but there was something some X did recently. I thought, wow. It was directed, you know, it was something, it was on H, I think probably on HBO. Oh, The Witches, right? Was that what it was? 
Yeah, it was. He did the witches about a year ago, and now he's hey, doing. Uh, now he's doing well, Pinocchio. I just know at the end, you know, it said, "Oh, you know, directed by Zemeckis," and I thought, "Well, no wonder it was so good," you know. Yeah, now he's doing Pinocchio with Tom Hanks playing Geppetto. Oh God, yes, Christ! Tom Hanks. Well, now what's happening? What about that scene going on down there? I have no the idea. Aviation equivalent of uh, Band of Brothers. Oh yeah. I know about that. That's uh, going to be something. Oh yeah. Um, so, you know, it's uh, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Band of Brothers. Uh, I think the working title is Whirlwind. Oh, okay, yeah. Band of Brothers has such a huge following. I'm sure it's going to be really good, and a lot of people are going to like it because you know they just yeah. did, they just did a Sopranos movie, you know. So all these HBO TV series are being turned into movies, and they're getting good responses. I heard. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, well, it's funny when, when you when you mention Swaggies, right. the importance of kids. You know, you bring it out now, and you know, kids should see it now. Yeah. Um, I found myself thinking about something I was discussing with a friend about the importance of young children seeing, well, films like this new project by the sound of it that Spielberg is doing. Right. About these young guys in these, you know, these big four engine bombers. Mm hmm. You know, that half of them got killed. You know? Yeah. You think. You know, younger people, they should know about these things, you know? I know. They don't use uh, technology the way it should be used. They have it right in front of them. And instead, you know, they're playing games and going on social media instead of looking up oh. knowledge, you know? Oh, it's such a big waste of time, you know? It is. It really is. Gerald, I every can't... Every time, you know, at my age, I mean, every time I mention to my friends, <clears throat> I'm going to buy it, I'm going to get an iPhone. They say, no, don't get an iPhone, don't. You'll never use it, you, and it's true. I mean, <laughs> I probably <laughs> never use it. I have a new flip phone. It's driving me crazy. Yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> we have to get. I tell you, a friend in Toronto just sent me. Mm -hmm. He knows I'm an an aviation fanatic. Yeah. He sent a thing, Tex Avery. Oh, nice. MGM. Fred Quimby and the guys that um, you know those guys that did you know uh, Tom and Jerry and oh yeah really Tom and Jerry and all that stuff oh yeah and it's a it's a film about a it's cut real 2D animation fabulous and it's about a, a an old a Boeing flying fortress who's married to another old Boeing and they have a kid it's called I think it's called uh, I think it's called Jimmy the Jet. Okay. And they have a big kid and it's a jet plane. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, I, oh God, I should send it to you. Yeah, that's what I do. I'll send it to you, Tommy. Okay. My I'll... computer, okay? Okay, perfect. It's fabulous. It's classic. It's only those American guys, you know, the Quimby guys, you know, Tex Avery, Fritz Freeling, yeah. They could do that stuff like nobody else, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, they were just pioneers of the whole medium of cartoons. I mean, look at their impressive body of work. Oh, gee, it's just amazing. Yeah. And uh, I, well, I, knew, I knew Chuck Jones very well. He was a close friend. He would, came up here quite often. Oh, yeah. What was he like? Um, he was, had some great stories. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> About how he hated Bob Clampett and all of that. <laughs> well, some wonderful stories about Fritz Freeling. Oh God, <laughs> I can't tell them over the air. Yeah. Do 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 you know Phil Roman? Uh, no, no. Yeah, he animated um, the Charlie Brown Christmas specials and uh, how the Grinch stole Christmas and the the Cat in the Hat, all the Dr. Seuss stuff. Um, What's I, his name again? Phil Roman. Oh, Phil, yeah, I got a feeling. Well, I, knew, I had a close friend down there, Dwayne Crowther, mm -hmm. who did the Blue Meanies in Yellow Submarine. Yeah. And he was connected with those guys. I think he was a, a quite a close friend of Phil Roman. 
Yeah, he's um, he's ninety five and he's still kicking. He's he's my God. he's making personal appearances and you know just yeah, he's, he he takes a lot of pride in um, all the animation that he's done. Oh, uh, sure. Well, I should think so. You know. Yes. Well, my you know all the stuff I've done, I've it's always I don't know. I mean, I've I never really got into really good full animation the way Richard Williams did it. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought the problem is with some some animation, it's sort of a bit like bad acting. Some of it <laughs> over the top. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know. Uh, the UPA guys, people like John Hubley, and Bob Cannon, Stephen Basusto, they they broke away from the, the old classical stuff and got into, you know, those job of Boing Boing and uh, Mr. Magoo and all that stuff. Right. Beautiful, different word. I knew John, John Hubley quite well. He's a lovely guy. Nice. In fact, he was working on doing the backgrounds on Watership Down. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, I I checked it out the other night. It was on HBO Crave, I think. Nice. And I thought, wow, this is not very good. I can't remember that. I, anyway, I, you know, I watched about 10 minutes of it. Nice. I thought that was a great classic story, Watership Down. Nice. I'll have to watch the whole film, so I might be <laughs> jumping the gun. Gerald, this has been a, a tremendous honor. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. And I know that the holidays are different in Canada, but happy holidays, no, nevertheless. Well, I celebrate both of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Tommy. Well, good luck with everything, and uh, I hope your, um, you know, I hope your whole outfit there in California are going to have more luck. Absolutely, yeah. it's weather the- stuff, you know. It's starting to happen, yes. Please. Anyway, good luck, and I'll send you that Tommy the Jet thing, or whatever it's called. Yes, Tommy please. Tommy the Jet, or maybe Johnny the Jet, I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> please. I'll make a note to send it to you. Please do, sir, and please stay safe. Yeah, you too, Tommy. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, mate. Bye. Well, there you have it. Gerald Potterton. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, my God. This was a bucket list and a half uh, of an interview, and I'm so glad I got to talk to him today. That's cool. He's hip on the modern day animation and all that stuff. Even though I'm not a big fan of today's animation, but that's great that he appreciates it. And I'm glad we got to talk today. Well, but until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, "There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks." Liar, dudes. Well, I've been working in a coal mine, going down, down, working in a coal mine, about to slip down. Happy Thanksgiving.